as indicated, this is a workshop on, on a, an interesting and uh, quite um, uh, up-to-date topic, which is will cyberspace fragment along national jurisdiction. Uh, as a starting point, um, beyond highlighting that you may have noticed that this is the third workshop in a track that we tried to highlight and that we co-organized in a way with uh, ISOC and, and CG. Um, the first one was on the first day, uh, more oriented towards the technical aspects of fragmentation. The second one took place yesterday on the uh, more economic aspects of uh, fragmentation, and maybe we have the opportunity to come back to that a bit. And this one is more dedicated to, um, I would say, legal and jurisdictional aspects of, the, uh, uh, of this issue. My name is Bertrand Lachapelle. I'm the director of the, and co-founder of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project uh, with Paul Fellinger, who plays the role as a uh, remote moderator. Um, we launched this initiative two and a half years ago to deal with this issue of the tension between the cross-border nature of the Internet and the national jurisdiction. Uh, without coming into too much detail, the project is developing an international framework, a transnational framework, a due process framework for transboundary requests for domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data. Uh, it has involved more than 70 entities, many of which are um, represented around those tables. Most of the uh, speakers in this panel have, uh, have followed closely uh, the, uh, the project. We conducted a series of meetings in around the world in more than uh, 10 countries, 13, 15 meetings in the last two years in more than 10 countries, plus outreach meetings in more than 20 countries, such as this event. And um, there's also an observatory that supports the work of the Internet and Jurisdiction Project that is now composed of 33 international experts producing a newsletter every month with uh, jurisdictional cases. I won't get into too much detail. There was a flash session at the beginning of the week on uh, Tuesday. The video is online and it is a one hour presentation of basically where the, the project is and uh, what is the framework that is emerging, uh, the operational framework that is emerging to organize the relationship between the different actors. I'm particularly happy to have uh, the panelists who are uh, around this table. I will, you saw them on the presentation of the workshop, but I would like to list, uh, to list them in no particular order. Uh, on my left is uh, Guy Berger, who is the Director of Freedom of Information and Media Development at UNESCO. Freedom of expression. What did I say? Freedom of expression, I'm sorry, I, wrote, I cannot even write my, write my notes, that's unbelievable, sorry. Um, Vin Cerf is the chief internet evangelist at, at Google. Uh, some people around this room may know that he has other qualifications, but mm -hmm. I won't delve into this. <laughs> Anki Das sitting next to him is the director uh, for public policy uh, for Facebook in India and for India and uh, South Asia. Uh, Michael Niebel is the advisor for internet policy and technology at the European Commission and he was actually uh, the lead in the um, uh, task force that prepared the Commission communication on internet policy and governance that many of you might have um, seen. Uh, next is Benedicto Fonseca Filho, uh, director of the Department of Scientific and Technological Affairs at the Itamaraty, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. Uh, if you didn't know him before this IGF, I'm sure that you now know him very well because he has been prominently showing the work that Brazil has, uh, has done on those, on those topics. Uh, Norbert Riedel on, on my left is the uh, Commissioner for International Cyber Policy in the uh, Auswärtiges Amt, the German uh, Foreign Affairs um, Ministry. Joana Baron is uh, an independent researcher in Brazil, but she's working on those issues of internet governance for a long time. Uh, she was formerly with um, uh, Fundación Getulio Vargas. She's with ITS now, uh, or working with ITS and other organizations. Elva Natachi um, is in the Information Society Department of the Council of Europe, and she leads many of the work that is done in that, in that regard. 
Um, I think I've made the list. Kathy Brown should be joining us. The president and CEO of ISOC should be joining us uh, momentarily. Uh, she had um, a little bit of overlap, so she should be arriving um, soon. I recognize in the room a lot of people that have followed those issues uh, uh, for a while. And Jimmy Schultz is, uh, is here, Michael Rotert uh, as well. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge also, although he's not formally on the panel, but he certainly will have uh, comments to make as well, uh, Mr. Sastro Subroto. It's always difficult to, to pronounce, but I hope I did it correctly. Um, was the former director general of ICT application um, in uh, Indonesia and uh, was the chairman of the steering committee of the IGF in, in Bali uh, last year and who's currently a senior researcher in the in Indonesian Institute of Sciences and also a member of the uh, uh, Indonesian National ICT Council. So without further ado, this panel and this workshop is um, organized and convened by the Internet and Jurisdiction Project, but it is an opportunity to place the work we're doing in a larger context, which is this debate about fragmentation. One of the big challenges that we're confronted with, with you've heard this word fragmentation in many, in many sessions, in many discussions. What is at stake here is that what people call fragmentation, and there are many, many words, is actually a result, it is a consequence. The real cause is the challenge of legal competition. It is the fact that the legal landscape is fragmented. That is the starting point. We have the national laws and only a certain number of international arrangements. And so one of the challenges is, and I would like to start with this, we will have a first round of, of, of exchanges on this issue of fragmentation. What are the unintended consequences of the discussions and the decisions that are being made in the different countries? What is the challenge of applicable laws for the different actors? And move afterwards on some of the elements uh, that have emerged in the discussions we've led regarding how to handle the interaction and the interoperability between the different actors at the legal, at the legal level. So maybe I would like to, to start in that regard, um, and it makes only sense when we're talking about fragmentation, we naturally make it as a reference to something that is not fragmented. So as I said, the legal system is fragmented, so why is there an issue about fragmentation? And so I will probably start by asking Vint, as we discussed very briefly yesterday, how this question is coming in an environment where at the technical level, the infrastructure is, and the logical infrastructure is intended to be non-fragmented and global. Well, thank you very much. Let, let me start out by observing that, as you point out, the network is in some sense fragmented because uh, countries are free to interfere with the technical operation of the network. The consequence of that is that the parties using the network don't always see the same thing, don't have access to the same thing. That wasn't the original intent of the design. The design was intended to be uniform in the sense that wherever you were anywhere in the world, when you looked up a domain name and got an address, you would get to the same place everyone else would or to the same information and without going into a lot of technical detail about any cast versus other kinds of point-to-point -point, uh, transmission, it was intended that everybody had access to the same thing. Um, in the legal regimes that have uh, grown up around the Internet, uh, it's no longer the case that everyone has access to the same thing. And when we move away just from moving packets around and doing lookups in the domain name system up to the content level, uh, there are different views of how people's access to content and their uh, permission to generate content uh, varies from one place to another. And so what we're seeing is diversity uh, and non-uniformity in terms of uh, ability to access and to um, generate content on the network. And that is harmful, at least in one sense, and that is that we don't have the ease that we had in the earlier days when this was an academic activity to get access to information that we all wanted to share. We wanted to make it easy for everyone to see uh, what other people had, uh, had done in the research world. 
that's how we worked with each other. We shared our information. We didn't buy it from each other. We traded information. And that collaborative uh, attitude was very much a part of the original internet design. Uh, but now we're in the real world, and uh, it, it's uh, less uniform than it was before. So to piggyback on what you just said, this distinction and the structure in layers uh, of the internet means that, as you notice, the title has been uh, voluntarily chosen as cyberspace fragmentation, as opposed in a certain way to the infrastructure of the internet. We didn't want to talk about internet fragmentation, although there are many aspects that are related to that, and you can talk about uh, open standards versus closed standards, um, gated and walled gardens, and so on. What we're talking about here is mostly things that are related, as you said, to what people do on the internet, like the behavior, the content, and, and, and this sort of thing. If I could give you a, please, please. a concrete example, from time to time the intellectual property rules or copyright rules cause some content not to be available in country A when it's available in country B and sometimes you will go on the net and get a little note saying, sorry, can't show you this video, it's not allowed in this country uh, for whatever legal reasons there might be. Uh, so that's a concrete example of at much higher level than just fragmentation of the underlying technical uh, facility. As an illustration of what fragmentation or the diversity of legal norms uh, happen, um, Benedicto, if I can um, pick on you uh, first and maybe on, on Norbert briefly afterwards. Um, different countries have different rules applicable to, to content and also behavior. And I know that in Latin America, in Brazil in particular, there might be specificities regarding the national laws that make things illegal in Brazil or in other countries, uh, and not necessarily in another um, European or uh, North American country. And there's also the question of what is the applicable law regarding um, access to data and protection of data. Can you, can you briefly tell us how, from a Brazilian government perspective, this question of how to determine what is the applicable law resonates. And if you can, uh, I think we need all to speak a little bit close to the, to, to the mic so that everybody hears. Uh, well, thank you, Bertrand, and good afternoon to everyone. Well, I think this issue can be looked into from different angles. Uh, I would maybe uh, attach it from the angle of those who need to enforce legislation as, as you have said, uh, legislation regarding crimes that are committed with the use of internet. Uh, some of those crimes that are not directly linked to the internet, they can happen in the real world and also in the virtual world. And there are differences of, between nations. And it is, I, I refer that uh, the majority of cases in which our justice is limited in its enforcement uh, powers uh, that is mandated by law refer exactly to limitations when in contrast to other countries the request for cooperation is not granted on the basis of different legislation that prevails in, in that country. Uh, a very concrete example is and the most cases in which we have had difficulties apply to differences with the U.S. legislation in regard to, to crimes related to, uh, to, 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 to sex online, kind of uh, activities related to illegal practices, so bullying and uh, uh, sex ex exploitation online, that in our cases will, would demand some legal action and when we approach the U.S. authorities, we inform that they deal with it from a different angle and they rely more on the freedom of expression. The, those are not considered crimes, so cooperation cannot be granted. So I think that indicates maybe the kind of uh, issue that we, we should look into. Uh, it's not an easy thing, as you have said, because each national, under each national jurisdiction, the, there is an understanding that countries have sovereign rights to determine their so how can we reconcile those? I think this is an open, uh, open question that, to which we are collectively looking for uh, ideas, and I think this project might help very much. Thank you. In particular, if I may, may uh, push in one, one second. Uh, 
If I remember correctly, there are, there are situations in certain countries in Latin America, uh, I don't remember exactly whether it's, this is the case in Brazil, where laws for defamation have particular uh, provisions regarding situations when there is, for instance, a um, uh, uh, voting process, elections, or things like that, where it is uh, criminal in that particular moment to have um, defamatory statements. This is not the case in other, in other uh, countries necessarily. However, it is a legal basis in, in those um, uh, situations. That is an example, I think, of the, the type of tensions that can exist where the law in one country is, is uh, where the user is, is different from the law where the platform and, uh, or the operator is. Is that? Yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. In our case, for example, the electoral law uh, forbids some uh, practices uh, in the virtual world, and then there we have cases in which the justice requires uh, the providers to, to remove some content on the basis of the analysis that this would go against what is uh, lawful in, in the country, and again, there are some uh, collisions and different interpretations because uh, it is not evident for, for those providers that they should apply to this. So there, there is also an issue about this, and I think this would differ from country to country, but uh, with uh, significant impact on the way we relate mm -hmm. to, to providers. And, and there's actually a difference between the actual treatment of the content and the potential request for obtaining information about the person. We'll come back to that uh, a little bit later, but that's a distinction that is useful to make. Uh, Norbert, if I, if I may, um, France and Germany have one thing in common, among other things, is um, that we have legislations that are based on historic practice, or historic experience, sorry, regarding hate speech that is um, relatively specific and maybe there are other specificities. How does the question of applicable law uh, is viewed from, from Germany regarding international platforms or domain names? If you are asking uh, which law applies, I don't have an answer. But uh, I think we have to see that a wide variety of legal instruments uh, exists that have either already applied or could be applied to internet governance. And in Germany we use a notion which is quite unspecific and, and uh, you cannot translate it. It's Völkerrecht des Netzes. Uh, maybe it's something like international internet law or international law of the internet or even global internet law. But what is important is that we see that this Völkerrecht des Netzes includes legislation, social norms, self-regulation, court decisions, soft law, or whatever you can think about. So what we are doing at the moment is uh, we are starting a process. We will have a workshop next week in Berlin together with different stakeholders, bringing them together and make a mapping of what already exists because I think that's uh, it's a big surprise, it was a big surprise for me, that there are already so many instruments or, or legal entities you can use maybe, or which are already used. And now the problem is to, uh, to, to have a summary, to know what exists, and then you can discuss what is needed. So in a, in a certain way, uh, when you look at the, uh, at the system, the way it works, the traditional way is to use a geographic criteria, a territorial criteria in most cases, to determine the applicability of laws. And without getting into details, one of the challenges is that in any transaction uh, or interaction between actors who are in different countries, you get the localization of the user, the localization potentially of the user they are there interact with, the location of the server, the location of the incorporation of the platform or the uh, entity. And so it is always interesting and I want to highlight it. It is very rare when um, official representatives say, which is the reality, we have problem identifying what is the applicable law and what you're describing is 
uh, a sort of web of, of laws and norms and principles. And when you look at the definition of uh, internet governance, there is this list of principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures. And the challenge that we have today is the, the what uh, Wolfgang Kleinweister could call the spaghetti bowl of, uh, of regulations and, uh, and norms. Uh, I have, um, Guy Berger wanted to make a, a quick point and, and Vint. Uh, thank you. I wanted to, to just step back a bit because I think these are useful for hi highlighting the problems. But if we go back a little bit, first of all, it seems to me that, uh, as everybody here understands, but it's worth repeating, fragmentation is the antithesis of the Metcalf network effect. Mm -hmm. And what's important about that is that if you don't have a network of networks, if you have restrictions on interconnection at content layer, service layer, or even technical layer, actually everybody loses, not just those who are, 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 are disconnected in, in one way or another because of the, the Metcalf effect. So I think that's very important why this thing is, is useful. Maybe I can speak later at UNESCO. We've got a concept, Internet Universality, precisely to try Absolutely. and say this, but I'll come to that. But I want to say, just as I think, um, in terms of international human rights, uh, people speak about the free flow of, of information across borders. The default on the Internet should be one Internet, okay? Now, there's, in the free flow of information, you have some limitations, very circumscribed, but the norm is free flow, the same thing with the Internet. Now, we need to also think that law, we shouldn't just jump into law as if that is the, the, the solution, because a great deal of dispute resolution can be done independently of law or be done with minimal law. And the example was mentioned of defamation. You know, a lot of defamation cases can be resolved with, through self-regulation. It doesn't have to go to law. It only goes to law in the last instance if there's refusal. And I think that your project has a great role to play not in focusing on law as your first instance, but on promoting self-regulation and mechanisms that those involved can actually communicate through the self-regulatory space. Law becomes a much more complex and, and a final resort uh, for, for trying to deal with these kind of things. If you want to save the internet from fragmentation, I think self-regulation and mechanisms is the way to go. I want, I want to pick one, one word that you use that will become as a recurrent thread in many of the discussions, is the word default. I think it's very interesting to think in many cases about what should be the default uh, approach, the default norm, the, different, the default principle. Uh, I'll come to that later, but for instance, in the discussions that we lead or facilitate, the notion that when there is a, a request the notification of the user should be a default is an emerging principle that is, that is becoming very, very strong. Uh, just one issue, we may delve a little bit deeper on what you put behind self-regulation because there are conflicting interpretation of the term self-regulation and the role of the actors and the platforms and their interfacing with uh, public authorities is at the core of what we're discussing. Vint wanted to say something and Ilvana. Uh, thank you, Bertrand. I just wanted to uh, draw attention to one other um, reason that this kind of fragmentation can occur, uh, and it's business reasons. Uh, my wife doesn't like this, but it turns out that Downton Abbey shows in the UK starting in September, and it doesn't come to the United States until January, uh, unless you happen to have a VPN. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, so. Uh, so, and these are not considered, first you, you don't appeal to law perhaps other than the rights of the copyright owners to decide when and where and how their content can be displayed. But I, I want to make sure that we don't accidentally make it sound like it's always the law that intervenes or the government that intervenes. Sometimes businesses choose to share information or not share it based on what business models they have. But in that case, there is a strong backing by legal rules that are being implemented. <laughs> um, Elvana, you wanted to, to chime in. Yes, thank you, Bertrand. I would also like to step a little back and try to see um, fragmentation as a result and to better understand the, the reasons, what are the causes for this result. Um, mm. 
I think we need to, to focus on the uh, lack of legal certainty and predictability in relation to jurisdiction issues. And I will explain what that means um, um, later. So essentially here, the debate is about um, different countries have um, different approaches to questions of where to exert personal jurisdiction, um, questions of choice of law, and third category of questions is enforcement of judgments across borders. Um, and the, on the internet, we see these questions appearing, emerging in relation to e-commerce issues, in relation to free speech, defamation law, um, but also intellectual property. Um, I'll, I'll focus on free speech and defamation law because uh, these areas fall within the mandate of the organization that I work for. So, two examples. First, in relation to defamation, we see the phenom phenomenon of forum shopping. Um, there are different laws in different countries, different regimes for defamation. And that's an incentive for parties to go to the forum, to shop for the forum, which gives the better outcome for the claim. Um, as an organization, we have looked at this uh, um, issue of libel tourism and, and we have produced a document. It's a recommendation by the Committee of Ministers, um, which can be um, uh, consulted. Another example is restrictions that are placed on content by states on the basis of a national understanding as to what is legal and what is illegal. Um, you and mean by filtering or by blocking uh, whatever blocking. measures of Something restricting that is a decision taking at the national level yes um, but these measures can have an impact across borders um, because they um, prevent uh, people in a second in a third country to have access to uh, to a certain content um, but we know that there is no uniform, uh, uniform understanding internationally what is legal and what is illegal. So there we have a difficulty. Um, and the question then becomes how to challenge in the second, in the third country, a measure that is taken in the first country. So there are no simple uh, solutions to these questions, as we all know. And if we apply the traditional legal tests of jurisdiction, that is, for example, the effects doctrine, what we have there is... Um, what we would have there is that the mere accessibility of a website in a country would bring that website in the jurisdiction of that country. Um, and the consequence of this is that a website would be subject to the laws of every single country in the world. But this is un unsustainable and this r leads to uh, unsolvable uh, conflict and litigation. Um, so, so there is a need to, to address that issue. Um, also, uh, states placing restrictions on, on, on the content on the internet create problems for the free flow of information across borders and for the openness of the internet. Um, so there comes into play the, the, the risk of fragmentation because of the absence of legal predictability and legal certainty in, 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 on, on the internet. So this is what I'd like to suggest as an angle to look at the uh, risk of fragmentation. This actually links uh, quite directly what Guy was saying and what you're saying, uh, whether it is universality or whether it is free flow. This notion that there's a default and that any exceptions should be based on some kind of framework leads to the next question you were asking, which is, in the absence of a framework, the uncertainty leads, and this I will come to, 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 to Michael, uh, the way it seems to, to, to happen is that um, there are basically two reactions in this environment, apart from foreign shopping. One is to um, basically re-territorialize, i.e. to um, establish the validity of the national laws uh, through mechanisms, and we can talk a little bit later about uh, a potential trend. And I'm happy to welcome Cathy Brown. You're welcome. <laughs> I, I already said that you might have a little bit of delay, so you're perfectly within the delay. Thank you. So basically there are two, two tensions, and some of you know that I used to work for the French Foreign Affairs Ministry, and the challenge for the exercise of sovereignty is when you're confronted in an environment like this one, you have to find the tools that are available. And if there is no international treaty, if there is no international framework, you use your tools. And your tools is your national legislation. This leads to a legal competition 
that goes in two directions, either bringing the different operations on your territory to establish the maximum um, extension of the criteria of local um, justification for jurisdiction, or in the reverse, using the leverage of either the location of the operators or the servers or the companies to extend your uh, jurisdiction extraterritorially. And in many respects, this is one thing that we saw directly uh, last year with the, uh, with the revelations and the burden it put on uh, the Snowden revelations and the burden this application of extraterritoriality puts on, on operators that are based in one particular country. Michael, you wanted to, to, to intervene and maybe uh, as the European Commission is confronted with a, a, a national, um, sorry, a regional uh, multiplicity multiplicity of norms and, and rules, harmonization is possible when there is a modicum of convergence, but at the global level, I suppose that there is less likelihood to have harmonization on substance, right? Michael. Thanks, Bertrand. Cl uh, close to the mic because it's, they don't uh, capture for it. Thanks, Bertrand. Um, first of all, I want to want to challenge something. It, there is not a a kind of fragmentation process. I wanted to challenge Vint, uh, uh, I dare to, uh, on, on the aspect that has some, something has grown around the internet that frag fragments things. What my experience is being in the, having accompanied legislation in, in this period when the thing grew was that for a long, for a long time, the law side was, and, and the business, they didn't know what to do. This thing happened and it, it grew and, and now they have very often the technology to deal with it. Your friends from the copyright lobby, for instance. So, so that's, <laughs> that's one thing. In addition, they have our friends from France, they have created new instruments. Yeah, so, so you have this, this kind of uh, uh, this, this hybrid development. Um, you mentioned we have, we have in, 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 the, in, in the union, we have experience. Yes, we have. We're probably the only bloc that has experience in doing these things. But then again, you're old fashioned saying harmonization, no, no, that's no. an old fashioned approach even in the union. We're not all the, all the time <laughs> harmonizing. We're having different and softer ways. But what we've done is, even in the analog world, is to establish free flow of people, of mm. goods, uh, of, of services. So we have experience in doing this. And let's face it, in the union at the beginning, we couldn't have television reception. Mm -hmm. We had to establish it. We had to kind of get this. And, and some, some copyright flows are still not there. Yeah, <laughs> and that's one of the things we're lagging behind. But there is a lot of things we had to do at a minimum level so things could, could flow. So, so I think... Um, that we can still learn from that. And I think one notion, and I wanted, to, again, to go to the other side of the table, the, to Hubert, when he talks about uh, Völkerrecht of, of the networks, I'm going, I'm going beyond that, because as Völkerrecht is German, but I use a, a common lang lingua franca, use gentium, uh, in, in, in the, uh, we are really looking at some fabric which is beyond the traditional acting between mm. nations. There are ne many levels of norm setting. Well, the IETF, if it does an RFC, they, sometimes they don't know, but they are setting rules and norms that impact. So, so and, and, and I can, I see Michaela there. Uh, we, are, we are together in a group that talks about the new directory services. Now, when we look, about, look at, at, the, at the location and the question, well, how can we organize free data flow? We have to look at all of the, the conflicts of data transfer, data retention around the world. And that's in a global system. And that's done via ICANN. Hmm. Is it the, the back door or not? The, the, thing, the thing I would like just to, to, to track in what you, what you said, the example of television or telephony is an interesting one because in this case, it didn't work exactly this way. In the case of telephony and, uh, and um, television, you needed harmonization and you needed a rule to make it transborder. Whereas the characteristic of the internet is that it has been, unless I'm mistaken, but it has been structured as transborder on the technical level. And let's be, let's be honest uh, or candid. 
in a lot of cases, the very early solution for law, not going into the John Perry Barlow, there's no law, which makes no sense. But the first solution was company incorporated in country X, law of country X applies through the terms of service with the clause of jurisdiction. And little by little, it became obvious that this was not a sustainable solution as a whole and that a combination of these criteria and the applicable local laws had to be had to be invented. So I think you're absolutely right and harmonization is clearly not in the mood at the moment even in the European Union. But in our environment, one of the challenges that we see is harmonization on substance, particularly on freedom of expression and so on, is uh, at least uh, very, very far in the, in the future. But the technology is making things accessible without having had to, to do this. Maybe I'll, I'll take the, the, the opportunity and segue to ask Cathy uh, to, um, to, to chime in on this relation precisely uh, of, first of all, the sort of principle that is, that is emerging under the label of the default is access. I think there is, a, I saw a lot of people nodding when, when this was um, discussed. So the default of the network is access and ISOC is with the ITF developing the standards but that established this universality and this accessibility. How does ISOC see the challenge of the um, legal fragmentation of the applications that are on, on this infrastructure of the, uh, the use that people make of the, um, of the internet? I think I'm going to be brief and very high level because I haven't heard your conversation already and I, I apologize for being late, <clears throat> but I don't want to repeat things people have already said. I suspect Vint has already talked about um, the universality, if you will, of the technology. Having been uh, in government for a long time dealing with the other technologies like television, <laughs> like uh, uh, telephony, we know that they were both legal but also actual technical and sometimes uh, physics problems with uh, interconnection. So think about broadcast. You know, we still had to figure out how far the signal went before we could harmonize the technology itself. Similarly, with the, with the wireless platform, you know, right now, right here, there's still border disputes all over the place with regard to how far the signal goes and therefore who owns it. I was on the other side of the river from uh, uh, New York um, in Canada and had this f wonderful signal coming in from um, the New York carrier. So I sent them a note and said, thank you very much. I suspect that you're surprised that uh, you're letting your customers roam around in Canada. But they are not surprised. Of course we know that just bec the, the physics itself uh, is a challenge, by the way. On top of the physics, obviously, are the, um, the rights of nations, uh, in their view, to um, allocate uh, scarce resources. After all, that's what licensing was about, right? Uh, both on the, tele the telephone side as well as the television side and broadcast side. It, you see this also with respect to spectrum uh, licenses, et cetera. So there's a governmental notion that you're allocating uh, scarce resources, and they do that either by lottery, by auction, by license, but that's done. The internet did not grow up that way. That's what's amazing about it. There is no such thing as a license to get on the internet unless governments impose them, because there's not a physics problem. Uh, there's an infrastructure issue with whether the infrastructure is there to carry this layer of the internet over it, but there is not a, a, a necessity to allocate a scarce resource. Um, given that, the question of whether and what runs over it should therefore be regulated is one that I don't know for sure that I can speak for all of the internet society, but in my own view, is not only unnecessary, but even under the old law would be seen as a services issue which in my view, has a whole other kind of thing going on and probably a violation of any other kinds of, of uh, existing tariffs that that's being done. The point being, however, that to get into a licensing regime on a technology that doesn't itself require it seems to me the wrong way to go and that we need to be thinking about other kinds of um, 
jurisdictional, if that's even an appropriate thing to do. Bertrand and I have had long talks about uh, once you start talking about this being a jurisdictional problem, perhaps you make it that, and it's really not. So I'm not suggesting that local um, countries don't have some interest in what may be happening uh, with respect to getting the technology, with respect to some of the, let's call it, uh, effects or implications of the technology, but as to the technology itself, there has never been a need for it. I think the reason precisely, as Cathy said, that there is a jurisdictional dimension is on the use of the internet, i.e. the layer regarding content, rather than the infrastructure itself. I think there's, that's quite clear. Uh, can I just, uh, so, so Vindy has written a very excellent paper on social issues that arise on the internet, which is a whole different category than the use of it technologically, in Absolutely. my view. And I think these things are important to make these distinctions. Absolutely, and before you arrive, this is the explanation that I mentioned regarding the use of cyberspace fragmentation versus the infrastructure fragmentation. One thing I want to, 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 to move to is that as the description was made of um, a tangle of applicable potential norms, a tangle of criteria based on territoriality and so on, I don't want to open the, the whole can of um, the applicability of uh, mutual legal assistance arrangements which do not apply to a lot of the issues related to content. Um, the fact is that there is not a relevant framework or a set of frameworks that are available and the end result apart from the unintended consequences of this piling up of legislation, is the increase of direct transboundary requests from law enforcement or um, courts or public authorities in general directly to platforms that are located in another country. And maybe Anki, can you, can you give us from a Facebook perspective and in India how you feel that on an almost daily basis? So I think there are two aspects to those type of requests. One is on content takedown and, and the other is on, uh, uh, you know, sort of user data, user information. And I think there are, there are cases of applicable law and genuine cases of crime and there's no, it's nobody's case that, you know, those kind of demands will get contested. But the point is that it has to, that requesting process has to follow a certain standard of review. It has to follow due process. It cannot be like an email request from a private ID of a law enforcement official, and we see a lot of that. When we started, we saw a lot of that. Thankfully, the harassment. When that you see a private, uh, private email, you mean you receive personal, a personal email ID of a law enforcement official without any authentication that yeah. this is an authorized functionary of the law enforcement agency. So, so I'm there's law no law enforcement from country X, and, X so and like mail yeah, yeah, and you see that kind of request. There is no, uh, there is no uh, in the notice itself. There in the demand itself, there is no correlation as to what is the trigger in terms of the violation of the applicable law there's no recital of that and it's it's like we want this we want this user data and this content needs to be taken down so there's been a huge amount of work which private sector has done in terms of law enforcement agency outreach to build capacity to explain to them that due process and particular mechanisms of requesting have to be followed. What we've done at face, as Facebook is that we've published our law enforcement guide on our site. Mm -hmm. We hold trainings and reach out to law enforcement agencies where we try and educate them about these request protocols. I think there's a lot of noise which you see around jurisdiction, but the tension really emerges in these edge cases which are speech related mm -hmm. because the international standard on that and national laws, there is inconsistency between that. And what we, in, in the political speech cases or in speech cases, as you know, most platforms would look at international standards. And that's where, you know, sort of global platforms will say, follow MLAT. And governments get upset about that. Mm -hmm. Governments get upset about that because they feel that MLAT is equal to no. That is because inefficiency in the MLAT system. It's really a G2G issue. And I think private sector gets penalized because it's caught in between mm -hmm. this web. So we've been advocating at every forum. It's been a drumbeat. We've been, we've been pounding on every door. 
uh, and we've been saying that there needs to be an efficiency in the MLAT process, both in terms of the requesting con uh, requester country as well as the U.S. government. One thing which we've been talking about a lot in India is that can you kind of have a beachhead or a clearing house uh, in sort of important country and, and like regional hubs, create like regional hubs, and then carry on these G2G conversations to build capacity to make sure the form factors are followed, evidence is appropriately produced, so, and so that the efficiency process are dealt with. We don't want to get into that as private sector. We don't want to tell them how to do it. So we just feel that there is this inefficiency and bureaucracy in the G2G interaction as a consequence with which users are suffering, platforms are suffering, uh, and, and I think uh, this is something which they really need to sort out. But in, in, in that case, and for just to clarify the term, for those of you who are not familiar with the term MLAT, it's Mutual Legal Assistance Treaties that exist among a certain number of countries on a bilateral basis most of the time. It's mainly for criminal issues, and it has one big challenge, is that for them to work correctly, they first need to exist, and they do not exist between all countries. And second, they usually need dual incrimination, so that it needs to be criminal in country A and criminal in country B, which if I take again the example I was mentioning about Germany or, or, or France, or Brazil for that matter, the laws are what they are in those countries, and the laws are not criminalizing the same thing on both sides. So one element that I, I pick from what you said, and it's actually a, a, a nice connection to part of the work that is being done, in the, in the project, uh, in the Internet Jurisdiction Project, there's a, a, a common request format to interface and interoperate between the law enforcement and the requesters and the, and, and the companies. Is that something that facilitates the, the, the work and how can it facilitate the interaction? I think there is value in terms of looking at building more awareness about common form factors and also because then you're speaking the same language mm -hmm. and also making sure that you're using cooperation mechanisms to structure this rather than getting into the fragmentation mode. So I think there needs to be an emphasis in terms of international cooperation, both on a bilateral basis, as well as coming together as a community to make sure that people understand this. One thing which I'd really be interested to see is that how the INJ project involves more law enforcement agencies, more national governments, to create an appreciation for this model. Because the awareness level in the field is so low. I mean, we sitting here, we just take, we, we just sort of presume that this would be automatic mm -hmm. knowledge. It is not. And there sometimes there are very real situations mm -hmm. of law and order which they're dealing with. Uh, so I think, I, I think the more we can get out there and kind of make sure that law enforcement agencies, we're using the cyber uh, crime uh, sort of forums as well as the ICT bilateral forums, which exist on a bilateral basis between various countries to bubble this up. Uh, but this is a very urgent requirement because if, does, if this doesn't get resolved and that infrastructure issues both in terms of efficiency and the mm -hmm. G2G uh, international cooperation aspects don't get addressed, uh, unnecessarily I think everybody will end up paying a cost and not be good for anybody. Well, actually this picks on, on one thing I wanted to mention earlier which is the, the uh, sort of negative sum game type of thing and unintended consequences of national decisions that may, that may come. Uh, I, may, uh, I may turn to Joanna on this, uh, on, on the continuation of this problem of direct um, requests, uh, because there is a contentious uh, issue, and uh, I say it in the presence of uh, the very companies. There are a certain number of, uh, of comments that say, isn't it a little bit worrisome that the companies are now placed in a position of having to make decisions on freedom of expression or on privacy? Uh, and the reason is basically because you cannot know which court could be the right court to decide. How, how to handle um, th this thing? Um, hi, everyone. Um, thinking about your question and what has been discussed uh, uh, in terms of the, the standard should be free, free flow of information, the scenario changes a bit when you are talking about access to user data, because mm -hmm. then you are talking about privacy rights, and then it's not access, free, free flow of inf that kind of information, True. which is user data. And of course, that became lately uh, a matter 
of surveillance, uh, of sovereignty, besides a matter of users' privacy. So I want to bring uh, an example so, so we can uh, have this discussion in a, in a empirical manner as well. Uh, there is Marcus Civil is a remarkable uh, law, and we fought a lot for this. And for, there for is those who don't know the Marcus Civil, it's a civil rights framework for the internet in Brazil that address users' rights and uh, responsibilities of intermediaries and so on, uh, basically speaking. And then in that, art, in that view, there is a particular article which is very interested in terms of jurisdictional conflicts. It's article 11, I'll read it really fast. Uh, uh, it's not that boring. Um, it says, in any operation of collection, storage, retention, and treating of personal data or communications data by connector, connection providers and internet application providers, where at least one of these acts takes, takes place in the national territory, the Brazilian law must be the mandatory, res mandatory respect including in regard the rights to privacy, to protection of personal data, and to secrecy of private communications and logs. And as a user and an advocate, I read uh, this article and I said, great, Brazil is trying to protect our privacy, and yeah, I, I don't really know how this is, will be applied, but let's see. And then recently we had a case in which uh, national law was applied, but actually against user privacy, because we have one article in the Constitution that relates freedom of expression to a prohibition to anonymity, and then one app was launched in Brazil, or mm. ar around the world, which is called uh, Secret, yeah, and it was meant to allow uh, exchange of, uh, between people anonymously. anonymously. And this act has, be, has been pro, uh, pro, prohibited under this constitutional article. And by that, um, online stores had to remove that app from users, from mobiles of users that have already downloaded it. So, uh, it's apply, uh, national law was applied, but not particularly to protect our privacy. And then it's an example in which I bet that the developers ha had an issue with that, the online platforms, but also users that want to access a particular app or service. So, so the question that remains is, uh, how how to how to do that? How uh, if we go to international level, we should set some standards. But uh, where we go to all the international forums, um, I'm currently trying to map by issues, and what we see is that the the discussions to solve those issues are not yet the discussions to solve jurisdictional prob problems are not yet issue-based. And I think mm -hmm. that's something that uh, the internet and jurisdiction is trying to make in a multi-stakeholder manner, and it's very valuable. One, one, one of the things, without interrupting you, is mm -hmm. there is there is a clear um, expression that emerges in all those complex systems, which is the law of unintended consequences. Uh, what is meant by that is that you may want, I mean, Alvana was mentioning the fact that sometimes you get one country making a decision that seems perfectly okay, and it has an impact transboundary. Or you get one actor making one decision that seems coherent, but if every actor does the same, it actually does not scale and it becomes harmful for everyone. The interpretation of something that is intended in one direction can lead to something that was not intended. So it is another layer of, of complexity, which is not conflicts of law, but which requires uh, spaces for, for discussion and for dialogue so that the different actors can understand what their joint action is producing that is positive or negative. 
I want to continue the, uh, the discussion, but as there are many people in the room who have been involved in those issues for, for a while who may have comments or, or questions at, at that stage, uh, I will open the floor briefly. Um, uh, you have on your, on your um, seat or on your table um, um, a leaflet that basically describes the components that the, uh, the regime that is emerging or the framework that is emerging is, uh, is, is composed of. And basically it's built around two pillars, one regarding how the requests are being formatted and transmitted, and that includes what Anki was mentioning regarding uh, request format and, and elements in particular ensuring that there is a legal basis for every request that is being mentioned in the, uh, in, in the, in the request itself, and that there's a notification of the user by default plus databases for uh, transparency reporting and legal reference database so that there is a knowledge for all the different actors of what is the applicable law in the different countries. It, today it's done by the different companies but it is naturally duplicated and it's out of reach for a lot of smaller companies. So that's the first element of the regime that basically is about what I would call the plumbing. Like how do you format a request, how do you send it and how is it computed? The most important part that we will move to now is what are the criteria that are being used when the request is being sent to a private operator and this private operator has to weigh a large number of criteria and make a decision that in many cases is close to what a court should be making. And so before we get onto that, that particular element, um, if anybody has a question or a comment at that stage, we are already uh, well in the, in, the, in the discussion. Is there anybody or is it so clear that you just want to get to the next stage? Please. Yeah, okay. Uh, is there a roving mic somewhere? Excuse me, is there a roving mic? Oh yeah, Paul, so here. And the gentleman here, and then behind. And, yeah, and Benedicto. You going? No. Um, hi, I'm Rick Lane with 21st Century Fox. Um, one of the things that was we found interesting was, as part of the um, Aspen Institute's Aspen Idea Project, what they had a term in there called the seamless flow of information versus the free flow because of the jurisdictional issues. Um, an example of that is sort of the EU Privacy Directive and its relationship with the U.S. in terms of the safe harbor that was created. And you had completely different privacy laws um, with the U.S. and EU, and they were incompatible at one point, and there was concern that the EU would cut off an information flow um, back and forth through the U.S., and they came up with a very interesting concept that allowed for the seamless flow once the agreements were reached. And that, I think, makes more sense in this jurisdictional fight because you are always going to have nations who want to protect their sovereignty, have different rules of law, but what you wanted to do is be more seamless. You start off, as you said, with the default of free, the free flow of information, but then there has to be a seamless level where there are going to be jurisdictional issues, as you mentioned, in France and Germany, Canada, and other countries around the world, and you try to work that out in a way that is seamless to the customers. It's never going to be perfect. Uh, we can't try to make it perfect, but having the EU safe harbor kind of contract and relationships may be an interesting way to do it that allows for the seamless flow of information and not just the free flow. Thank you. There's, there's another wording that is floating around and that is being explored at the moment by the uh, CG network, which is legal interoperability, which is another. We, we're all toying about those, uh, those concepts. I have, um, if you don't mind, I will keep the, uh, the panelists for after the, just this brief round, unless you want to, to, to chime in very, very briefly. But I have this gentleman, this gentleman, the lady here, and maybe and another one there. Thank you. Go Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity. My name is Naveen Tandon, and I'm part of a global carrier association in India called ACTO. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, going by the title of the uh, workshop, it says, Will Cyberspace Fragment Along National Jurisdiction? In my view, isn't it already fragmented? It is. And there are two aspects which I would like to bring to the 
uh, to the gathering today. One, when we talk about uh, mutual treaties, global networks, we feel that the cyberspace is already interconnected. It's not uh, fragmented because there's a legitimate need to be to be sharing information amongst each other to be more secure because you don't become secure if you sit in your room and just lock the door. Second aspect comes from, and I'm not sure whether this uh, forms part of the present deliberation, is on the legitimate and the perception about around uh, how a country views the cyber security or the cyber space. And from that it comes the need to protect its own turf with respect to forming its own legislations and procedures to handle uh, uh, a request for lawful interception or for forensics or for any other requirements. So the question here is that, uh, is it good that the present system of having a connected cyberspace is good for the, uh, uh, for the world, especially the internet and the cyberspace, or we are happy to have country-specific legislations and once in a while talk about a globally connected cyberspace. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll, I'll, on a personal basis, I'll come back to that. Not as a moderator, I have one comment on this. Uh, please, sir, so, the lady next, and there was somebody behind. Is there anybody else in, in the audience? Michele. Yeah. So my name is Michael Parousis. I come from <laughs> Greece, from the University of Patras. And um, I'm a lawyer, too. So uh, I think we live in an international uh, order where we divide the world between states and international space. And we have the seas and the air as international space and the state territories. So if you ask any German or Greek or Austrian or Swiss uh, student about what is a state, what are the elements of a state, he will tell you it is the definition of Jelinek of 1911. This is uh, three elements. This is one people, a nation, this is a, a power over this people, and this is a space, geographical space. Now the problem is if we can transfer this traditional uh, definition of the state also to the cyberspace. And if we can distinguish between a cyberspace which is national and a cyberspace which is international, or if it is impossible per definition, and if the cyberspace can only be international. And so then the question is, if there is a claim of any state over this cyberspace that is related to its own existence, to its own place in the world. And that's my question, number one. And the second is a small introduction to the second part of this session. Um, as a practical lawyer, I had very, very recently a very strange request. A Czech user of Facebook publishes some statements about an Indian yoga organization that might have um, had um, some negative, let's say, uh, negative reactions or actions on her health. And so I have been asked by the Greek organization of this International Yoga Association to act against the Czech <laughs> Facebook user from Greece because on the base that this information is accessible from Greece, so anything that is accessible from, from a place justifies the application of uh, a certain law uh, against this person. And so this is a question I will have in the second part. So this thank is, you. This is the typical uh, type of case that we're uh, confronted with. Uh, just a very brief remark on the two last questions. One of the objectives, I mean the subliminal objectives of this, this kind of workshop and the work that is un conducted is to try to get mentally out of the dichotomy of it's either purely territorial and nation based or completely international or even regional. One of the biggest challenges is particularly the platforms and the, the uh, operators have created cross-border spaces. And the challenge is how 
is the coexistence of different norms managed in those shared spaces, i.e., how does sovereignty exercise itself on territories that are not bounded by a very strict limitation, in sovereignties that are not separated, but sovereignties that have to be coexisting in, in transborder spaces? Because otherwise, as Guy was saying, we're killing the benefits of having the mid caliph effect and the, and the cross-border. Um, Madame, and then the gentleman here, and then Michele. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to continue on, on an abstract level, but rather a go, go. practical one. Um, my name is Sarah Ludford. I'm a member of the Upper House, the House of Lords of the British Parliament, but until May, I had for 15 years been a member of the European Parliament, and I just wanted to re react to the comments by the gentleman from 20th Century Fox about Safe Harbour. Um, because, uh, um, I mean, unfortunately, Safe Harbour has been extremely controversial in, in the recent past, not least following the Snowden material. And um, the European Parliament actually voted to suspend uh, Safe Harbour. Um, and even, I mean, you can see that even between the EU and the US, it is extremely difficult to create a space in which there is mutual confidence and mutual recognition of uh, data protection and, and privacy uh, norms, and thus uh, you get, obviously, conflicting claims to jurisdiction. And um, so, you know, the ideal would be indeed to create a space of interoperability, and you know, it looked like we were sort of making progress towards that, but that has rather been thrown into reverse. I mean, even um, to the extent that, at least in a draft version of the report the European Parliament did in the second half of last year on surveillance, there was talk about a European cloud, to which some of us objected, and I think it, it, it got its way out. I mean, what on earth is European cloud? I, I asked it, not innocently. Um, but, but that did lead us in the draft reform of data protection law to set up, if you like, an intentional tension, which is to say that if uh, companies have Europeans, d data belonging to Europeans, and it is subject to a foreign court order, i.e. FISA, or e.g. FISA, the FISA court, um, then it could not be handed over except in the context of an international agreement, e.g. an MLA agreement. So, I mean, that, of course, sets up the conflict of jurisdictions and um, I mean of course no doubt Europeans would say that's not extraterritorial jurisdiction because it's about our data arising on the territory of the of the EU but I, I just wanted to really to slightly um, rain on your parade in, in the sense of saying unfortunately safe harbour is not um, kind of going very well at, at the moment. Without, without opening the particular basket of access to user data in general and privacy, uh, you're aware of the um, um, court process at the moment in the US regarding uh, data that is managed by Microsoft in uh, European data centers that are being um, requested to be communicated in the US. I think these if I can make a thread before, before giving the floor. One thing that is emerging clearly is that actors are currently wondering what are the applicable rules. Right. And in most cases, if there is one thread, and I see nodding, I mean, the problem of what, um, uh, I think it was uh, Anki, or maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but the, the lack of predictability, or was it, was it Elvana? I don't remember. Somebody at the beginning said the lack of predictability, the worst thing in law, the worst thing in the legal system is when you don't know what is applicable because you get forum shopping, you get going around, you get bad implementation of rules. And the challenge is that today we are in an environment where each actor, apart from meetings like this one, and this is why we wanted to have a workshop here, uh, is taking decisions on its own in a type of prisoner's dilemma situation where you don't know what the others are going to do. And so this is why processes that can be in intergovernmental organizations with the different actors or when there's a, a, a meeting like was done in, in Net Mundial or in our processes, getting the different actors together is so, is so important. The gentleman over there, then Michele, 
than Can I just Jimmy. Make a response? Just my, my, uh, no. I'd like to not open the oh, debate yeah. on the no, safe harbor. No, not I just wanted mind. to clarify that I was talking about a format of exchange, not that the safe harbor was the perfect, but to have the seamless flow of information to allow for trans border transactions of, of information no. back and forth. Yeah. But I not think to, there's a wonderful uh, uh, post workshop uh, <laughs> discussion on that. Um, so I had, uh, yeah, the gentleman over there, then Jimmy, then Michele, then Igor, and that's good. I, I'm, I'm glad that the, and, and yeah. sir, yeah, the, the microphone to the gentleman here, just behind you, just behind you, there. Hello, uh, Ashley James with uh, Chalmers and Associates. Um, I'm actually responding with a, with a kind of general question uh, because okay. the idea of fragmentation, at least as I understand it being discussed, is something about a kind of uh, view, uh, a kind of transparency within the space that from all points then uh, is uniform looking at all other points. Big loud. Ah. Uh, and whether or not that is being in some way uh, distorted or affected. Uh, but at the same time, uh, my question is, uh, does the internet, in a way, have properties uh, that help it sustain its own kind of uniform transparency? An example of this is how quickly uh, Mr. Cerf mentioned uh, the VPN technology, how things like this emerge, and how this behavior then proliferates and allows users to, in a way, uh, bypass attempts at fragmentation of the view within the space. Uh, and then these kinds of behaviors are recognized later. So, uh, very recently, uh, in the Canadian exceptions to the copyright uh, laws, there's for user-generated content, there's an exception, and it's also being reviewed uh, in the Irish review of the copyright law. And part of the way that they are being uh, sustained, these exceptions, is uh, to uh, basically align copyright law with the expectations of the users. But the user expectations are evolving uh, in sort of uh, emerging, in relation with emerging mm. activities that seem to uh, arise within the internet because of some of its technical properties uh, and because of the practices within the community. So my question is, um, in a way, does the internet have uh, uh, a kind of properties or... or a sort of self-healing system? What's that? Yeah, in, in a way. self-healing system, that's, a, that's and, the next and the question. capacity to protect itself uh, and to maintain a kind of uniformity of transparency within it. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy? Then Michael and Ellen, then Igor, and I think I will come back to the uh, to the panel because time is moving forward. And, and you, sorry. Uh, so I'm being fast. Jimmy Schultz. I'm from the internet. Um, uh, I'm speaking here for guerrilla.org, um, digitalguerrilla.org. Um, I'm, I'm glad that Windsurf is here for the discussion because he's uh, one of those who developed the the internet protocol, which was invented to be very stable. And an urban legend says that it was even invented to survive a nuclear war. And in fact, it survived quite a number of governments and lawmakers so far. Um, and now the question, so how do you deal that, the, with the fact that um, the net will always find a way around and around laws? I don't, I don't know if I should answer this question. It's related to, to the question that was mentioned before. The, the, route, the routing uh, uh, around, the key question is whether the national laws should apply or not, and to what extent. I think the solution of circumvention is one thing that is contemplated in one dimension, but that doesn't solve the problem. The problem, if you ask me as a Frenchman or as a German citizen or so, is it good that there is a circumvention so that people in Germany can do hate speech that are absolutely contradictory to the national law? I don't think it fits with the national framework the way, the way we want. When it is in a very repressive regime where the law has been imposed and so on, probably yes, and I think that's where the balance is. But uh, I have Michele and then um, Igor and here. Uh, thanks, Bertrand. Um, Michaeli Nalen, I'm the founder and CEO of Black Knight. We're the largest uh, hosting provider and registrar in Ireland. Um, 
I'm also several other things, but I, most of them aren't particularly pertinent to this conversation. Um, I think this session is very, very important, Bertrand. I think having as many views in the room discussing this is really important because for a lot of us in the commercial sector at the moment, this is a huge problem. I mean, for, for us as a hosting provider, we're looking at how do we expand and grow on, in the market, but at the same time, we're also having to con consider the risks. If I start, if I physically install hardware in Argentina, or if I physically install, put hardware in South Africa or in, the, in North America, what's going to happen with that? Which laws are going to apply? And, I'm, and I kind of know the answer. I mean, the question you're asking is which laws apply. I think that's, it's kind of been answered in many respects, because if you look at country codes, for example, they're going to normally follow national law. And I sincerely doubt that any government representative is suddenly going to say that, you know, Brazil's laws um, should be ignored in favour of Germany's laws or France's. Though I know, Bertrand, you disagree with that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, this, that kind of thing, it's a... How do, we, how do we actually move forward with that? How do you move forward in a fashion that allows for the respect of national laws, but without ending up in a situation where you end up with a fragmented internet? I mean, the, the, concept, the concepts we're, we're dealing with now are not going to go away. If anything, they're going to become more complicated. I mean, I am amused that um, Vint mentions the, the issue around Downton Abbey. I mean, the same thing happens with a lot of US TV shows. The US gets the TV show on a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. um, I might or might not have access to it on Sunday afternoon <clears throat> using a variety of different technologies, but officially <laughs> it will not air on Irish TV until Monday or Tuesday. And this is all down to, well, money, ultimately. It's down to licensing, it's down to money, it's down to content control. Um, the other problem, of course, is when you're dealing with law enforcement, and I see some of them sitting around the room here. And what's it, they, they have the MLAT, but it seems, from what I can, have been told in various fora, it's a very, very slow, complicated process. So what ends up happening? They ends, it ends up where law enforcement try to sidestep, it tries to sidestep these things and push it on to private sector entities be they content platforms, search engines, advertising networks, domain registrars, hosting providers, or others, to take action without going through a full due process. And I, I just think you know, this, something has to give somewhere along the way. Thanks. Thank you. We, we, we have a, a list. I'm, I'm now closing the list of, uh, of speakers because I want to finish with the, with the panelists. Um, the, sorry, the next one was, I think, Igor. And then Mr. Sabroso Bruto. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, to support the thesis of harmonization of national law. Let me bring the example. Um, the uh, Russian legal system uh, is set up so that uh, international treaties has the priority. Uh, the international regulation is above federal law. Uh, I mean, national law. Uh, and uh, let's take the example with the violation of uh, human rights and freedoms. Uh, if it happens, the, the user uh, has the only possibility to appeal to the local authority. And in case of internet user, we are talking about a common re regulation. And if the local authority has, has no regulation, or, or this regulation is not harmonized with the international, that's the problem, that's the gap we should fill in with the international regulation which does not exist today. Mm -hmm. That's the reason, the main reason we should focus on when we are talking about fragmentation. Uh, 
to, to pick on to pick on this, and I will give you the floor, and then um, briefly to Benedicto before we, uh, we, we 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 finalize. I mean, to have something to to harmonize with. To pick on the word harmonization, and without belaboring, there is a huge distinction in what we're talking about between harmonization on substance and harmonization on process. I think harmonization, and that's a little bit the bet that we are that we're taking. Harmonization on substance, especially on speech-related issues, and correct me if I'm wrong, is distant at best, very difficult because the norms are going to remain very different. And in many cases, they are going to remain different because they are part of the identity of the different countries. However, establishing an, an approach that ensures a better due process in the management of those uh, requests and interactions is another type of harmonization that can help, if not solve, but handle the, the issues. I take the opportunity to also mention that in the different interventions, we, we have different types of actors. Uh, Michele is a registrar, and it's a category of DNS operators that are working at the logical layer of the internet. Anki was representing fa uh, Facebook and, and Vin Google who are working on the application layer. Michael Rotot will make a, a brief comment, will, is on the providers uh, uh, level as well. We had content providers. Sir, we'll have to wrap up quick. Thank you, Bertrand. And uh, just call you Ashwin, because my family name is rather difficult to, to spell. <laughs> Well, I'm familiar with that, don't worry. <laughs> a lot of people have a problem telling mine. Yeah, let me step back a bit about the jurisdiction. I think uh, in the real space, we always have this jurisdiction issue. And even hmm? when we are talking today, we have also jurisdiction issue. Now we are talking on a, not on the Turkey soil, legally. We are talking on a UN soil, although it is written there Republic of Turkey and so on. But if I said something wrong or illegal in the Turkish law, the Turkish police cannot do anything to me because I'm standing and speaking on a UN soil. And it is normally written in the agreement between the UN DESA and the government. So in the real space, it's a problem. Well, we know that there are many countries fighting because he is, they said it's my jurisdiction, it's your jurisdictions. In history, showed us, showed us uh, so many problems about that. Now, if it is important in the real space, a big issue in the real space, it is also important and will be a big issue also in cyberspace. So why not? Now, in real space, to some extent, we had already some, convention, some sort of convention for land, sea, and airspace. And we start to discuss about the outer space, convention on outer space in the UNGA. But uh, my comment is that while outer space is still very far away, I mean, outer space jurisdiction, we can see a lot of problem in the Hollywood movie, but not yet in the real life. But the issue in cyberspace is already there. So it is in this respect that we need to discuss more and set up the, how we would like to solve the problem of uh, cyberspace jurisdictions. Now, before we come to a global convention about this, before we can have an interoperable, interoperable legal system in the cyberspace, then as we had discussed in the high level leaders meeting in IGF-8 in Bali, the default, more or less, the default approach is to use good intention based on international cooperation and cyber ethics, where Hopefully, all countries can accept that. And if a country has national laws, other countries are requested to appreciate, to give respect to their national laws and support each other. So basically, this is perhaps if this can be accepted as a default approach while waiting for the convention, global convention, and hopefully our cyberspace will be okay and we don't have fragmented internet, fragmented jurisdictions in the cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you. 
before I give Michael, I think Benedicto may have to leave, so I will give him a, a, a priority, and then, Michael, you will have almost the last word before I close. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Bertrand. I, I did not touch initially on the Brazilian uh, Marco Civil, the civil framework, because I, I thought that would not be maybe too helpful in the context of the discussion. Uh, actually, I thought it would be uh, Marcus view is an example of a national legislation. I think it was very, uh, maybe an aspect that should be highlighted it, it's in its development. It had very strong multi-stakeholder participation, uh, inclusivity, including, including by using the internet as a tool. Uh, it was approved by the legislative and it provides some solutions in regard to net neutrality. There was a discussion on forced localization that was avoided in the end. Uh, it provides uh, some aspects of the legislation that are applauded by everyone, others that are rather controversial, but this went through Congress and this is something that followed due process uh, according to our legislation. Uh, so, but I think the, the, the heart of the discussion here should be, uh, and I, 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 I agree fully with your assessment that we are living, we must accept the reality in which from a legal point of view, fragmentation will be there and you'll have to live with that. So the proposal of your project, which we think is very good, is try to harmonize at least from the point of view of the procedural aspects, the due process that should be followed to try to organize the, the, the requests and the, the procedure. I think this is a good approach. It has to be seen whether that would <laughs> lead to some uh, actual solutions because in the end it might happen as it has been said that even following due process we will come up to a solution in which the, the, the person requested will prefer to abide to its own so it bring us to square one. In other cases such as an issue that has not been touched yet but I think it's at the very heart of this discussion another angle would be tax collection which is something very important that should also be looked into at some point. And just by, because I was, um, I had some information flowing to my computer coming from colleagues in regard to what was said by my good friend and colleague, Joanna, uh, just to indicate that this piece of legislation that was adopted in Brazil and the protection for privacy that is provided there uh, says that all user data can only be accessed through judiciary order uh, and everything we'll do will try to protect uh, privacy. Uh, however, it says it has to be done under the Brazilian legislation and the Brazilian constitution, which is not overridden by the Marco Civil, uh, prohibits anonymity. So uh, in my opinion, it does not touch on the privacy aspect, but it forbids anonymity. This is something that is controversial, we know, especially from civil society, uh, the, the, there is not an acceptance of this, but it is enshrined today in our uh, mm -hmm. constitution. I, it, it will not go away because we approved the, the Marx Civil. But having said that, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. And, you, you're welcome. And, and congratulations for this project. I think <laughs> just to highlight also another point that Net Mundial, one of Net Mundial's recommendation was that this issue deserves to be pursued uh, and be further developed by the global community. So I applaud your efforts. I think this is very welcome and we'll be more than ready to, to contribute to this. Thank you. Actually, I, I thank you first. Uh, but uh, I, I also would like to, to mention, we didn't have the opportunity to discuss in detail another aspect, which was the drive and the call in some cases for data localization, i.e. having the data in the servers in the country. And without getting into details, uh, I encourage you to follow what the debate had become in Brazil because precisely you were starting from a position of strong data localization and you have incorporated in Marco Civil something that I call more scalable internationally than what data localization would have been. So that's one element. Michael Rotter, you have the, the, the last uh, word and then I will wrap up. Um, please. <laughs>
I'm from the German um, Internet Service Provider Association as well as from the European Internet Service Provider Association, EURESPA. I'm not sure, and I was thinking all the time, if either the question is correct you put in with will cyberspace fragment along national jurisdictions, um, or if the question is valid at all. Um, given the future, um, or, or, or having a, a little look in the future, what is when real end-to-end -end, uh, communication comes into uh, the scenario? And I think Wind uh, knows what I'm talking about because that was foreseen in 69 already. Um, if, you have no, if there are services where you have no server in between, you don't know where you, you may not know where you end up in which jurisdiction or in which legislation applies because you don't know where the other end is. Full stop. This is one scenario, but coming a little bit closer to the presence, what about all the apps in the smartphones where you have no idea on what the manufacturer puts in and where you, you have no chance uh, to modify it or to go somewhere else uh, and you may end up in illegal areas where you even didn't want to go to. That's my five cents. That, that's, a, that's a fair point. We are, we are unfortunately um, at, the, uh, at, the, at the limit uh, of, this, um, of this discussion. Uh, Joanna, you wanted to, to make a very quick uh, comment. Yes, sure. Just a close remark is that what we could see in these discussions is that always when there is a jurisdictional conflict, we always have on one side uh, law enforcement and companies. And if we don't really think in, uh, about a process which is open that in, involves users, users will be always be set aside. So, and then that's my closing, closing remark. Um, yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll make a, a, very, a very rapid uh, wrap up. You have the brochures regarding the project, and I encourage you to go and watch the the presentation of the um, uh, of the flash session on on Tuesday. What I just wanted to highlight, and the purpose I think that has been largely demonstrated of the workshop, was to explain why this is needed. So fundamentally, it's not about what we are doing. I could go on for another two hours on the different components of the regime and the difficulty of of establishing or the importance of establishing dispute resolution mechanism, dispute management mechanism. What I wanted to highlight, and I think it has been proven, and I'm extremely grateful for the different panelists who have accepted to be numerous and therefore to have limited time for themselves to make, to make statements. I hope each of you has also benefited from hearing the way the others was perceiving it. The nutshell is we are in an environment where this hot, hodgepodge of norms and rules is making the situation so unpredictable by everyone that the biggest danger is this legal competition where everybody will take decisions that look normal, legitimate on their side, and cumulatively may have detrimental effects or unintended consequences. Not only unpredicted, but long term. There are dynamics. I give you just a very quick example. The fact that GOIP filtering is increasingly used to manage this question of what is the legal content access in one country or the other has a potential impact on the way the IP addresses might be distributed in the future and the way it might be attached to the devices and facilitate surveillance and so on. So there are many interconnections between the different topics. If I can hope you leave with one message is that on all of these issues there will not be probably one overarching framework but even if there are efforts and I don't want to open the debate that Igor was mentioning of whether there should be an international uh, treaty or different regional arrangements or other things even if there are efforts are doing something collectively it should be more on an issue by issue basis like trying to sort out specific criteria. What we are doing is on 
transborder requests for data, uh, sorry, uh, domain seizures, content takedown, and access to user data. There are other processes that can deal with uh, other specific topics, but the need of having all the different actors around the table is absolutely obvious. And I must say that I congratulate, uh, by the way, Council of Europe or UNESCO and RC, uh, OECD as international organization that tried to produce mechanisms for the different actors to work together. Uh, these organizations are also participating in the, in the, in the process. The workflow, the work plan for the project is to develop the specification, the technical specifications of the um, interfaces that I've been mentioning, to document the emerging norms and criteria, and to uh, refine the procedures for dispute management. That's going to take place in the coming, um, in the coming months. If you want to, uh, I don't know if this is working. Uh, if you want to uh, have, well, yeah, there it is. If you want more information, please go to the internetjurisdiction.net um, site. Follow our Twitter site, uh, Twitter feed. There's a newsletter every month that you can subscribe to. Don't hesitate to connect with, with us. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank in, in the end um, the, the different actors who are actively participating and supporting the, uh, the, the project and make our work possible. That includes companies that are Facebook, Google, um, Verizon, Disney, but also um, CCTLDs in um, Brazil, in India, in um, uh, Canada, in France, uh, but also the Zigrid Rousing Trust, um, PIR, ISOC has been funding uh, also in, in the past, and I'm trying not to forget anybody, um, and Switzerland has also been funding. So I hope you appreciated this, um, this workshop. There's no hope to cover this topic in one hour and a half. I hope it gave you a feeling of the kind of problems that we are all collectively facing, and we all have a responsibility to try to think about the impact of what we are doing individually on, on other actors. And thanks to all the panelists for having saved this, uh, this time in, uh, in your agenda, um, and follow the work that they are doing as well, because it is interesting. Thank you so much.